This conference will now be recorded. This is Sweetwater <laughs> One's 2019 facility plan with the State Construction Department. We'll introduce ourselves first. Good morning, Brandon Finney, State Construction. Uh, my role with the team is to identify all the capital construction needs, work with the school districts, develop budgets, and present them to the legislative bodies. I'm Raj Dami, I'm the accounting analyst. Um, I help everyone out here with uh, whatever they need in terms of uh, database information. Amber Leach with State Construction Policy Planning Analyst, and my role is to work with the districts on the documentation for today's facility plan meeting. Lance Johnson, Project Manager. I work directly with the district. Troy Decker Planning. My role is uh, Quality Assurance. Make sure our facility plans follow state guide our state statutes and rules and regs from our commission. Make sure that we capture all the information needed to uh, get accurate reports so that we can send those to the commission and the select committee. And then make sure that everybody has a good voice within the process. Good morning, everybody. I'm Kelly McGovern. I'm the superintendent for Sweetwater Number One. Dan Cellarelli, Director of Facilities, Sweetwater One. Mark Portello, Assistant Facilities, Sweetwater One. All right, well, good morning. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Uh, Amber, if you can turn off, we're going to turn off our video, guys, simply because sometimes we have uh, streaming difficulties in our office. So, but you guys can leave yours on. You look so chipper this morning. You're going to cheer us up. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, uh, Paul Severson, I just highlighted him yellow. As you well know, I take notes during these meetings and you guys are more than welcome at any time to uh, jump in. If you see notes that you don't disagree with or have recommendations on our part, we're more than uh, happy to, to adjust those and, and we're open to do so. Uh, one of the things I always tell uh, districts, and you know this very well, and, and that is that uh, every once in a while we have the, the governor's office request a facility plan or a legislator. Uh, and when they do, these facility plans are really good because they can help someone in about a five or 10 minute time period to really have a good understanding uh, of the facility needs and uh, priorities and what's going on in that district with regard to all of their buildings. That's why we do a lot of visuals on these also so that they can be complete and whole. And then, of course, as well, we've always, uh, not always, but uh, several years ago, I started separating the district notes from uh, our notes so that make sure that everybody has voice and everybody can uh, uh, say what they need to and uh, we can respond accordingly. So the first part of this is as, uh, as Amber works so well with the school districts uh, is uh, basically the, we're gonna go through kind of a checklist of housekeeping and, and just make sure that the database is accurate as possible because the database is, our database is authoritative and uh, information within it is sent over WDE and it does affect um, your block grant. And then uh, of course, WDE sends over us ADM and enrollments that affect your major maintenance uh, and your enrollment projections. So with that, uh, Charlie started last year and this year as well started using the county GIS sites uh, and that's really important because those are basically become the authority by which we establish the acreages on properties uh, and uh, and then of course we allow districts to work through the, uh, the county uh, assessor and stuff to make sure that um, those acreages are correct and if they need to be updated they're updated and then we can update our database we've also put some visuals <laughs> If you can see all your schools in there, I wish you the best. Uh, but anyway, it's just a, a, a quick visual of, of the, uh, the sites that you have, uh, which is Wam Sutter, Farson Eden, and, and then your, uh, your ones around town there. And I know you have a, um, I think that's it. I, th I was thinking you guys have another rural, but now that I think about it, I'm thinking of Sweetwater too. So with that, then we'll just kind of go through this fairly quickly. If there's something to be said, we'll say it. Otherwise, we'll just move on until we get something that the group as a whole can discuss and is uh, is justifiable for us all to, to discuss. So uh, you guys have verified the accuracy of your acreages. This does impact your uh, WDE groundskeeper allowances. So thanks for doing that. Land leases, state law requires us to track all leases. So thanks for working with Amber on that. 
and I just basically said the AIM, data, AIM database is up to date. District has not purchased or disposed of land, and you have no intention of doing so. So that's uh, what we wanted to capture. Property profiles have been updated. You verified accuracy. That does, as I said, impact your major maintenance. And uh, what we send over there from this database impacts your operations and maintenance payments. <clears throat> Guys have a few buildings. <laughs> Districts uh, reviewed leases. These are uh, leases within your buildings. These are important because they do impact allowable square footage. And if ADM drives enough allowable square footage, it can actually add to your um, an account toward, I should say, your major maintenance payments. And you've reviewed enhancements. This is a report that by uh, that we have to send to the select committee each year. Just said AIM database is up to date with regard to those things. Also down here, guys, just a second. I'm just kind of going through the stuff that uh, shouldn't uh, shouldn't take too long. Okay, now district appropriations. Uh, so we do have two. It looks like the Farce and Eden. Uh, looks like it's complete with the exception 11 month walkthrough. Uh, so Lance, um, with that still, uh, well, that's February 11th now, and this is February 27th. I know you guys fi fi filled this out a little while. Is that 11 month walkthrough now is done? And so warranty period is is over for at least the 11 months. Is that correct, Lance? And no, we're right at the right at the uh, rescheduling of the 11 month. It slipped by the plan one, so he sent an email out the other day. Um, it'll be shortly. Okay, so uh, what do you want to do? There's uh, three million left in there of unspent funds, uh, and state statute requires us to at least uh, explore and see if we can return that uh, appropriations. Hey, Dan, Lance, this is Finney. Um, so the process would probably be, it's March now, pretty much. It won't be done until May. By the end of May, will you guys be done with uh, everything, including buying some FF&E and whatnot? Yep. Yes. So my proposal would be to, um, we got a sheet that Raj is keeping track on. We can make a specific note saying, uh, close out project in May. We need to work with Lance and Dan to ensure or expenditures are met or liabilities are met, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that, sh that should get us through there. Yeah, what I do is I write a letter. But if I, we put this note in here, I'll work with you guys. Um, so you got FF and E to purchase. How, how much money or what do you got to do? Are you going to have to go? <laughs> Brandon, at this time, it's pretty much everything that's going to be spent probably has but we just don't want to completely close it out at this time until we have the 11 month walkthrough so okay. you know there's what we what we have let me look on the pm report here you know there's just been a little a few things of ff and e just uh flowing in but not not very much at all and dan you do you have any idea if you have anything out there right now that um, Actually, you know, one of the things that happened too was we, with the change of principles, and the other new principal came in and realized that there were some things that they could use. So we went ahead and ordered some stuff. We submitted for FF and E. I think we're um, pretty much caught up on on you know everything. But what I would like to do is I'll take the opportunity to sit down with the principal and go over <clears throat> the approved list for FF and E and make sure that we did receive and deliver everything. Yeah. But but right now there's uh, about 2.6 million of 2.7 million of uh, budgeted not contracted <laughs> money there that uh, is not contracted. Obviously we don't want to do anything with the contracted funds at this time. But yeah, uh, if you had to take some, I would I would say we we could uh, uh, certainly give up some of that 2.7 million. No, we don't have to take any of the sessions. It's pretty much done. But um, I'll just work with you when we do it in May or so. And okay. uh, we'll have a meeting just to double check and verify that we're all on the same page. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, and then the second one, the new satellite high school. Uh, we're just going to hang on to that money, obviously, until you guys uh, get that design done and get the capital funding to do the construction. If there was yep. efficiency. Okay, Lance, security. Okay, well, uh, I've been uh, out of the office for the last week, so I really don't know what's going on with uh, the legislation. Dan, you probably mm -hmm. know more than I do about it with that new 14 or 4.9 million dollar uh, legislation that was there for additional security um, uh, I'm not so sure where that ended up yet do you have any um, idea on that one Brandon yeah so the legislature House Bill 1 did appropriate the 4.9 million however there was a small caveat and they um, had it still placed on priorities like one through six, eight, and 11, or whatever the original priorities were. Troy's gonna head down there and we'll just check it out here. Uh, but while he's getting there, when we when we saw that come out, it got amended in uh, the JAC. If you recall through the budgeting process, the department made a rec to the commission to open it up to all 20. The commission made a rec to the governor and select to do the 20 and it went all the way up to the legislature. But when I got there, they reversed it back to where we already were. And when that came out, you know, there's gonna be a lot of dead money just sitting there because some districts have already done those items and, and it didn't have any flexibility. So there it is right there. So we went and talked yesterday with LSO and then wrote a letter to the governor's office. And if you look right there, fuck it. Now the, it's, so it's back at the legislative level, and I, they have the ability to override the veto if it's two-thirds votes. And they're reviewing those today, and they may end up on Monday uh, completing it. So as of right now, it's struck by the governor. Okay. Which is great, because this is where we need to get that gives the flexibility <laughs> to, uh, to address all 20. They would submit a work order. We're developing a process. Uh, but they had to submit a work order, which building they want to do, what element, and get going. Okay, very good. Uh, <clears throat> so, anyway, uh, Dan, you're aware of your 10% major maintenance security that uh, the uh, um, July 2016, um, right, the one July time. 2018, yeah, you get the one time for those two years, and uh, there had been talk, and Finney, you might be able to update us on this too, but there had been talk that in fiscal year 21-22, the 10% of the, the major maintenance security may not be funded. So we've got to we've got to make sure that we watch your 10% budget balance when uh, we start using that money up. Right, and you're talking <clears throat> the 10% security funds. Yes. The one that's earmarked 10% for security. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah, we're we're in good shape. Right. And, and then, I just want to make sure that we're every time that we put in for the 10 percent, I've got to validate that, verify right. that there's money there. Now and, I got a question. Now that 10 percent, we can use that 10 percent one to 20, correct? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. You yeah. can okay. you can use it for anything, and it does not have to qualify for major maintenance definition as well. Right. Yeah. I knew that. Thank you. So you're also aware that uh, the process we use to uh, move money, transfer money from one element, security element, to another, uh, and acknowledge that that uh, there was no back funding for that. But with this uh, additional 4.9 million dollars, obviously that will not be the case. You can put that money back into uh, any of those security elements that you need to. <clears throat> right. Just uh, for clarification. Uh, yeah. it, if I have something comes in under budget from what is on my allowable budget from FEA, you know what their projected budget was, that goes back into the security funds, and then I can request to use that in one of the other one through, you know, well the one through six, eight, and eleven. Correct? That's correct. Because what we do is uh, when you give me that proposal. Then I write the DAL for that proposal. It stays with that element that we did the DAL on. And then if you do not bill against that, or if you bill against that and not 100%, it's, it just remains there. And we right. would all, we could just dial it back out and unencumber it and, or de-encumber it and then move it to another project if you need to. Okay. 
Okay, and uh, you're also aware of the uh, security um, uh, security conferences that we've had, and uh, hopefully this year we'll have some other ones uh, throughout the year that we can be uh, uh, getting involved with as well. Okay, yeah, and I, I attended those. In fact, I spoke at... Uh, <coughs> Okay. Um, and Dan, are you aware that there's also uh, grants out there from Homeland Security and Department of Justice for security that uh, you can check into? Actually, I, I was, but I, I honestly have just not had the time to go into it. I see. Okay. That's all I had, Troy. And then this second year of the biennium, which is now the general session, uh, 10%, just uh, to remind you, in that 2018 category, you're going to have another uh, one, 2019, that's going to be another 300,000 because you're going to be able to spend up to 10% more based on this year's uh, major maintenance, coming year's major maintenance payment. Right. So that would increase you again back up to around almost 700,000. Well, yeah, from... <clears throat> Uh, my total started with uh, well, we had the two hundred thousand plus another, you know, um, and then the three hundred plus thousand, three hundred plus thousand. So yeah, we we actually <clears throat> in pretty good shape if we chose to use all that money on on our security. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, and then there's just a reminder, and Dan, I'm sure you know this, but uh, we just want to make because we talked to a district the other day that. Um, you always want to use probably your regular major maintenance first if something qualifies uh, as you're drilling with security needs if you need to supplement that capital and then you then then your 10 percent security lasts because that has so much more freedom in the funds right okay yeah and I think that's what I've been doing okay <laughs> and plus another thing too I want to mention is <clears throat> you know, we still have the eight percent and between some of the projects that we just had come up, um, we were going to use 8% on security. In fact, I talked to Lance about it, and you know, we I kind of hammered out the logistics. But as it turned out, when we had our fire in Dell so that we can use our major maintenance to move forward, I'm just going to dedicate the 8% just so it's easy for bookkeeping. Okay. Thanks okay. for doing like that. Yep. We'll reimburse when we get our insurance payments and everything. We'll reimburse that, so we'll still have eight percent that I'll use on, uh, you know, as part of my major maintenance money on security before I tap into my ten percent that I'm allowed to. Does that make sense? Yep. Everybody looking at each other. <laughs> okay. You're looking at your team there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sounds good. All right, let's go on to uh, capacity then would be the next thing we'd look at. Uh, this is just a list of building by building capacity percentages. Um, your Rock Springs High School at 100% as of October 1, 2018. It looks like if uh, there was no uh, veto or, or change uh, on House Bill 1, so you guys are still in there for your, what was it, 17 million? Yeah. Uh huh. So you, you guys are good there. <clears throat> yep, yeah. <laughs> that was like a struggle or, or event or process, huh? We're, we're, yes, we're, hoping, we're, we're hoping you guys qualify for something else in future so Kelly can go uh, defend, defend the district in front of a select committee. <laughs> and I appreciate that, Troy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thank you guys for your help on, on everything. Thank you very much. Well, I think it was a good team effort. Everybody did their part, district, consultant, uh, and our department. And you're welcome. And we're, we appreciate you also standing up and doing what you needed to, to get the funding. So that was great. All right. So we always try to kind of take your elementaries in town and separate them. You guys are 87.76%. So that's good. We uh, uh, did, did not include Lincoln Elementary School in that, in this analysis. Uh, we're just looking at the ones that you guys are using right now. And I know we'll be talking about Lincoln here in just a minute. Uh, enrollment projections, uh, and I try not to assume anything. 
so the actual enrollment methodology uh, basically says we look back 10 years, uh, so 10 years in the past, and then we project out uh, 10 years into the future, what those numbers would look like if a remedy is coming so that we can uh, make sure we right size any uh, capital project. And how these work is all you do is follow a grade down. So like this 12th grade, if you kind of backtracked it up in this 300 numbers, it's just a stair step. So they were kindergartners in 2006, first grade, second grade, third grade, and it just follows them through uh, the number of students that go from grade to grade to grade uh, or advance for, within that class to from grade to grade to grade. And then what we do is we always compare one, uh, one um, grade level to the next. So we, we take the 2008 kindergarten, 2009 first grade, 2009 kindergarten, 2010 first grade, and we do that, and we do, basically, we average those 10 years, and then it shows a survival rate, of, uh, a computational survival rate from kindergarten to first grade. You guys, have you retain over the last 10 years, on average, 98% of your kindergartners advance to uh, first grade, then 98% advance to second grade, and so on. Uh, so you guys, uh, in, in your territory, basically, um, uh, except for one year, I think that must be from like fourth or fifth to sixth, uh, you guys actually retain over the last 10 years 100%. But other than that, you guys are losing students as, as you go on through the grades. Uh, and this is usually typical your junior year. You, you uh, is usually the highest one for dropouts uh, with regard to um, uh, losing them to advancing uh, from sophomore to junior year. So pretty pretty typical uh, or close to typical uh, pattern uh, on that. And that's always a challenge for every district to make sure that uh, obviously you want to retain as many students as possible. And sometimes they move out and sometimes uh, uh, maybe they, uh, later on they may not continue with their education at those upper grade levels. For you guys, uh, you got a, a nice... Uh, number of kindergartners this year you pop back up but your average over the last 10 years for kindergarten class is 458 uh, you guys have been down a little bit below that um, particularly the last couple of years it looks like you're maybe climbing up just a little bit uh, and then this is the one we were we were concerned about here this 912 or uh, yeah your 912 population uh, just exactly what it was going to do. Uh, you guys did drop down a little bit. That did lower your high school capacity percentage, but it looks like your appropriation's gone through, and uh, so you guys are going to be able to still um, take advantage of, of uh, the previous uh, um, enrollment numbers that were reported and, and the appropriation request this year was based on. So that's a blessing as well. Overall, uh, looks like you've lost, eh, give or take, about 100 students. Uh, and so 102, it looks like. Uh, and we recognize that that means for every one of those students, it's 15, basically $15,000. Uh, and so that creates uh, more challenges on your on your um, your block grant and your general fund. But anyway, uh, that's about all our observations. Any um, response or thoughts uh, by the district with regard to enrollment? Okay. All righty. Uh, you guys, right there, you're at 100% still. Um, there was a, this is basically the statewide capacity list we put out every year. There's, uh, according to the commission rules and regs, there's a high capacity of 100% or more. You guys are 100%, medium capacity and low capacity. So you guys are still in the high capacity uh, um, uh, category. Uh, what happened last year, and you're uh, well aware of this as well, the commission did uh, change its methodology for capacity to 25 students, maximum K through 6, and then they got a lot of pushback from um, districts across state, and so they reneged on that and they came back and they went back to a restricted capacity of 16 students for kindergarten through third grade. State statute does not require a one-to-one -one correlation between our methodology or uh, the SSC's methodology and uh, student funding in the block grant, uh, but uh, that's what they chose to do. And so what happened then is basically a bunch of elementary um, 
schools popped up configurations in different districts. There were two in this cat high capacity last year. Now you can see we have, what is that, a total of eight or something like that, seven. Uh, and so that's what happened. The elementary's pushed up. Um, people like to ask, well, Casper has three, they're short 300 seats in their schools. Well, in the schools they're using, yes, but they also mothballed four others, so they have 921 seats left. So um, that's a non-construction alternative. I don't anticipate asking for any money for them because of the availability of, of space in those other buildings they shut down. So that's a statewide look. It's kind of important here, and we might as well just talk about it now, and I'll, I'm going to skip just a few things and run down the very bottom. Um, and that is that in the past, historically, we've been requested by the select committee to give them a capacity list uh, and make prior, um, just like your building, your, your satellite high school, make recommendations off that capacity list, uh, independent from condition. And the condition list, uh, which is the FCI list, we've uh, presented that. And then when those... Um, those different buildings or requests uh, generate an appropriation. We've been dealing with educational suitability simultaneously through those capital appropriations. Uh, the, the, the world is different now. The rules and regs specifically, SFC's rules and regs specifically say that every building has three scores that wrap up into a composite score. They're going to have the uh, condition score of that building with 50% with of its weight, weighting total, 50% of uh, weighting is going to be tied to condition, 35% capacity, and then 15% to educational suitability. Educational suitability, we do have an assessment that was done in uh, 2009, basically, and a list came out in 2010. Um, so we've got an eight-year-old list of educational suitability scores, uh, but that's the best thing we have right now. We do have SCNI scores with every condition assessment, and the N stands for illumination, air quality, and technology readiness. And that may or may not fit within this as well. So a uh, new world out there, and uh, these, this is going to generate a, prior, uh, a priority list uh, to the commission. Uh, and then we're just trying to figure that out internally, what else we're going to do. But um, and, and I think we may have talked about this already, Kelly or Dan or Mark, but uh, and just curious and I'm, it's more for my curiosity than anything else. Uh, so you, maybe you can respond to it uh, along with this out this dated educational suitability numbers, obviously we're going to have to update that or we're going to ask for funds to update the suitability assessment and go across state. Uh, one of those things what we'll, we'll want to do is basically revisit the suitability criteria and work uh, with districts across the state, let you guys be stakeholders in that process and give input as to how that should be adjusted and how to measure that educational suitability in an updated matrix. Um, the other thing we keep uh, at least uh, one other possibility within that, uh, of course, that you know we can hand all this to a commission and then they could approve it potentially and it could be forwarded to a select committee. The select committee could come back and say, why don't we, you know, they could say, well, let's stick with the capacity and, and uh, potentially the uh, um, condition list until you update the suitability and then, and then we'll, we, we can uh, maybe with more accuracy uh, look at that combined list. We don't know what they'll do. But the other thought, and I think we've discussed this already, and that's the simple fact that uh, the possibility of just like the major maintenance payment is based on ADM and allowable square feet, uh, and stuff like that, and it, then it's dispersed appropriately and equitably to the districts. What do you guys think about potentially uh, educational suitability where perhaps based on ADM or whatever, uh, maybe a calculation that generates money for educational suitability then basically is paid kind of like a major maintenance payment. And then school boards, kind of like when you get your block grant, you guys decide what to do with it. Uh, within the parameters of what you are allowed to do with it, but uh, some kind of an educational suitability based on ADM or something goes to you, and then you, through your school board, decide, okay, what 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 are the greatest priorities in educational suitability and how we, how we can we address that? And as long as it's paid on um, 
uh, work codes within AIM on facilities. Obviously, it can't be uh, based on behavioral or other things you guys use your block grant for, uh, personnel and stuff, but on physical facilities, uh, then basically submitting those work orders and getting those approved and then working forward to, toward whatever you guys decide on educational suitability. What's your thoughts about that? Okay, my thoughts would be as long as it, there's a way that we can have, you know, a consistency across the board. So that means all everyone who reviews the AIM numbers is consistent from one end of Wyoming to the other. Then it has to be really drummed into everybody on the district level that that money, in a sense, is just like major maintenance money. It still has to be used or it can only be used as long as it has an AIM number attached to it and it meets almost like the psych the security criteria you know if you're going to put suitability i'm all for you know if we can get another pot to bring some of these classes up to date because you know i look at my school uh, some of my older schools here and going back to my uena days i mean they have school you know we've got schools that are in good shape but one of the big differences is <clears throat> when they built schools back you know 20 30 years ago you got one circuit for two classrooms and where today you get three circuits per classroom, you know, and technically I can't use major maintenance to upgrade those classes and it would be a huge expense because not only is it putting additional, you know, wiring in the classroom, but in some cases it's bringing in um, new services to the building to accommodate the you know, electrical load. I mean, that's probably the easiest example. And as long as there's a, you know, in the, as far as the major maintenance, you know, uh, or the suitability slash major maintenance, as long as there are clear, defined, consistent rules that everybody understands. Otherwise, my my worry is if they do if they deliver it kind of like what they do in block grant. There's some school districts everybody knows it's no big secret that what's supposed to go to maintenance of the buildings funds other programs. And from a maintenance perspective, we can't have that go on anymore. It has to go to whatever it was de designed and designated. And there has to be some sort of way that it, it cannot be used for something else. Other, I, I think it's a great idea. I think it's about time that we had an opportunity to use a fund, you know, if they're thinking about that, to upgrade these classes to make them more suitable um, as long as nobody abuses the system, uh, I, you know, maybe, we, you know, I think it just comes down to putting some kind of a stopgap where just like on major maintenance. I mean, I, I've worked with Lance now for many, many years and, he, you know, it, he's consistent. He knows if I put something in, he'll give me a phone call and say, no, nope, you can't use the money for that and, and explain why. And as long as, you know, everyone across the state is held to the same uh, standards, I, I think it's a good idea. The, pro hey, the problem with it, Brandon, is potentially it's uh, not measurable. It's measurable in condition, but there's no educational suitability measurement or matrix by which to measure impact on educational suitability. Scores go back and score the building to adjust the scores on that? Yeah, so there's no real, no real specific number tied to educational suitability per facility, per category. So that's probably going to be the pushback from the legislature if this idea comes up, is my guess. Because uh, you know, with with state funds comes accountability, and with accountability comes measurability. And if there's no measurability, then uh, they're a little reluctant to give the funds. To sum it up, we're going to have some challenges moving forward with the process. Well, hasn't okay. Laramie one kind of already broached the subject when we were up in um, oh wherever it was in the uh, Wheatland? Is, isn't that didn't the company that they use kind of argue that they can measure it? Yeah, there's yes. a couple of them out there, so um, it can be done. It's just uh, standardizing it at state, you know, across the state as a whole, and then measuring it, implementing it, money to fund it. So, yeah, but I, I okay. think that there's some. I, th I think there's some that I could argue. I mean, I. I Obviously, having computers in classrooms, I mean, it makes a difference. Uh, and if you can't run certain things in your classroom because your electrical issues are not up to par and I can't use major maintenance for upgrades, 
like adding, you know, three or four circuits per class, you know, when you multiply that by school, you know, that's, to me, that's kind of a slam dunk as far as, you know, does that affect suitability? Yeah. Should, could you be able to designate that just like you do on your security, you know, and make, you know, electrical capabilities, you know, or, or you know, I, I think some of it's pretty easy. You know, some of the others, you know, it doesn't matter in test scores. You know, I, I, I think that's, you know, then you're getting into the gray area how that happens. But I do think that there's some physical things that we all know make a difference in the building. And we should be able to bring some of these. If we're going to do asset preservation, I don't see how you're going to be able to do asset preservation without being able to bring these buildings up to a suitable standard of some sort. Yeah, I would agree with that. Well, Brandon, I hope you didn't mind me asking that, but these guys have a lot of experience. I just thought it'd be interesting to see what they said on that. Yeah, I, no problem. I'm looking forward to getting through the hurdle. <laughs> yeah, it's, hey, it's going to be a, a long one. Yes. This is Kelly. Along those guidelines on from the instructional standpoint, I think that's a great idea. You know, some of the things that Dan was talking about, you know, when I think of our current high school right now, you know, we have a lot of the rooms where we've used, as everybody, you know, here knows, we've used every crook and cranny. But there's parts in there from an educational standpoint for science labs. That's a perfect example. Not only the circuits for um, the electrical, but science labs in order to be able to do the experiments, have science fairs, things like that. You know, having the classroom space to warrant those, the uh, where do we place the kids and the need to be able to even hold those classrooms, you know, that's a real issue. And I think that is a great way to go, especially as we try to save and work with our older schools and keep those running um, as much as we can into the future. But I know that's very real for us as we move into the satellite school and we get that up and rolling. You know, we still have those needs at the other building from, you know, a teaching standpoint, you know, and next year we've got at least five more classrooms going in there and we'll have that same kind of thing. You know, how do we get kids access to the equipment that they need in order to get the instruction that they need? So I appreciate that question. Thank you for asking that because it is a real true thing that we experience here in our schools and in our older schools. So thank you for that. You betcha. And thanks for your input. And uh, and hopefully, you know, we can come out of a, a process this next year in such a way that everybody's unified, the, the state construction department and the districts as they uh, move forward with a potential, uh, um, I don't know, addressing this uh, to the legislature and making some recommendations. <laughs> And I think that's the strongest position we can have. And uh, I think, I hope that, that we can get a lot of participation so that th that's the kind of um, impact, I guess, that could be um, maybe potentially um, realized as this is presented to the, to the select committee and the commission and as it moves up through there. So uh, continuing on with uh, capacity, you guys mentioned, of course, your high school and stuff. Um, and then I just said, you, you basically are talking about numbers and students moving up through those ranks. And uh, uh, I know you guys are looking at your junior high uh, and are a little, uh, cons uh, have some thoughts, I should say, with regard to your junior high. Let me see here. We have that broken out here. How much is it? That's at 88%. So we realize that that's uh, continuing, hopefully, to continue to grow for you guys. Uh, but anyway, anything else? I just said that basically the satellite is uh, being considered for legislative appropriation. Uh, unless it's uh, two-thirds overran or something, I mean, I think that one's, that it wasn't vetoed. So I think it's pretty well approved. Any other comments on capacity? No, nope, I think we're good. OK, charter school, you don't have one. That was easy. You guys know what facility condition assessments are, obviously, and what those numbers mean. Uh, so I don't think we'll spend a lot of time on that. Uh, with regard to uh, condition, uh, this is just page one, uh, about 30, the first 30 buildings on the condition, uh, facility condition index. Uh, and uh, you guys are not, don't have any uh, that are in the top 30, but we just do that illustratively. 
uh, in these. And you do have one on the ancillary building. We separate educational from ancillary or support buildings, uh, the old Lowell Elementary School. But I think you guys wrote down here uh, that you guys did invest money into that. And that score should be on the next assessment improved uh, quite a bit, Dan. Yeah, that's correct. And one of the other things that we'll do is um, the upstairs in Lowell, as we move forward, we'll, we'll more than likely, I mean, the wall, wall systems, I mean, it's, it's an old school. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start um, replacing some of the, the cabinetry. Actually, we're going to rip the cabinetry out. So we'll be doing a little bit of renovation on Lowell as well. So by the time the next, when is our, is our next uh, FCI score in next year? Yeah, we're going to talk about in just yeah. a second that schedule. Mm -hmm. okay. But yeah, um, we've already done substantial amount um, thanks to the help you know with you guys with the the partial demo and stuff like that. And um, I, I think that by the time we come to, to our new um, FCI score, and we'll, we're going to be in, we're already in good shape. We just need to do something with the second floor. It's interesting that this is on the support facilities. It won't be next time because you guys are using it now for K-12 education. Right. Uh, yeah. So that's why it was stuck here. Uh, obviously, it'll pop up to the to the um, over to the education side. Uh, one right. reality we're trying to point out here uh, with regard to ancillary buildings, the state statute does require that the commission prioritize educational buildings first for capital requests yeah. over ancillary or support facilities. Um, so with a lack of money being uh, uh, put toward uh, uh, and, and the limitations of money, I should say, uh, for facilities now on the educational side, um, we don't anticipate anything really coming down the pike for um, capital funding for support facilities unless it's some kind of an emergency or something like that. Um, these are pretty well major maintenance is what's taking care of them and that's probably over the long run what's going to uh, be required to, to uh, keep those buildings in good condition or uh, potentially component requests. Okay. All right. Alrighty, condition for all your buildings from great, uh, greatest need to least. We've talked about that, I think. And here's your support facility again. We know Lowell pop up on the educational again later. And this is where you just mentioned your, your Lowell and it'll go up. Uh, anything else you want to say on condition district before we move on? No, I, you know, we're working, we're, well, we're working on a lot of the, Previous scores, um, as far as you know, things that were you know threes or down almost twos or twos. Uh, one of the one of the things that I have a great concern with, and I know it comes up later on, and that's you know the way the funding is so far uh, going through the House and the Senate. Um, that's that's going to impact some you know some of the. Uh, it's going to definitely impact how we deal with some of our deficiencies this year and. I think everyone will be back on track for this time next year, but uh, that quarterly that's that's going to be uh, it's going to it's going to greatly impact the way we do some of the condition scores and how we you know what our capability is of taking care of them. Definitely, you'll have to probably relook at or analyze your um, whole process of which ones you're going to go tackle, sort of restart the clock and before you move forward. Yeah, and I think that's kind of the stance that I approached our school board with, Brandon, is to kind of just restart the clock and take on our emergencies um, you know, and, and move forward. And I mean, but as far as just because something's a two and I have the time to do it, I'm, I just don't, I think it would be doing this district a disservice to start taking, you know, spending down my bank yeah. with the hopes that we're going to get a full payment at the last, you know, two payments of the of the year, because if I read things correctly, and you can certainly, you know, it set me straight, uh, the last payment, and it could be the last two payments, because they get their, doesn't the state receive their funding twice a year from uh, royalties and things like that, and so you really don't have a guarantee that your last payment or two payments is going to be in the amount that you anticipated. Yeah, it, it should. It should be a straight line payment across the whole all four quarters. OK, 
Okay, but, but isn't isn't the um, wasn't the whole idea of doing this one? They want to collect the interest, but also <laughs> Nicholas made the comment that he didn't feel comfortable paying out until he knew what the payments were going to be coming into the state. And I took that as a business, um, you know, in a business sense that hey, if I don't get it, you don't get it. Yeah, I I think they'll borrow from a fund if, to make the liability. So okay. Yeah, I don't think they'll do that. Boy, that would have a that would have even a bigger effect, but. All districts right now are sort of, um, you know, planning on sandbagging their major maintenance to, to adjust and and start moving forward, uh, how they're going to move forward and analyzing that. So they may have big plans to do a bunch of twos and stuff like you were saying, and, well, that might not have to get pushed. Along. We have enough savings to get through the the new new process. Right. Okay. Yeah, other than that, Troy, I'm good. Okay, uh, one thing I did want to Raj or Brandon or someone over there, if you could check in the AIM database and make sure Lowell, the old Lowell Elementary School, shouldn't we, should we be changing that name, Dan, or uh, or put in at least parentheses, well, you're running what out of there, your alternative school? Not your alternative school. Hey, it's it's just the old Lowell school, it's not the alternative school. The alternative school is uh, uh, Blackbeat. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, what are you running out, what program are you running out of there? Educational. They're running the um, alternative daily uh, living skills and then also the alternative communication. So there are two special programs um, and then also the transition program into the community. Okay. For kids until 21. They're so they're special pro programs. Yeah. More of a sped ed program. So maybe we could put parentheses special ed programs and parentheses, and that would help us a little bit in the descriptor. What do you guys think of that? If it if it helps, you know, on your end, not a not a problem. We probably wouldn't call that that here on the local end, just because we don't, you know, we have kids with their needs, and so we don't want to upset those families. Transitional school. You know, it could be Lowell Transitional School. I mean, something like, like that. We just don't want special education to label the kids that are within that Tra building. Transitional education, would that work? There you go. There you go. So, guys, I don't, I don't know if we need some formal uh, form uh, put in there, but my recommendation would we go into that property profile, uh, do uh, in parentheses transitional education uh, at, at right behind Old Laurel Elementary School. Uh, and then put in the notes per this facility plan meeting, uh, change name, uh, you know, in in collaboration with the district, something like that. What do you think, team? Yeah, I think we're good with that. Okay, good. So you captured that and we'll do it. I appreciate that. And then let's make sure also, team, that that is uh, categorized in educational building and uh, what grade configurations are in there, Kelly? Aren't they 712? They are currently right now it's um, nine through twelve, but then also we have kids through twenty one. So really ninth grade through twenty one. Okay. I don't think we have <laughs> that category. We'll put nine through twelve if that's okay. okay. Um, but anyway, so it's is it needs to be educational and nine through twelve, and we acknowledge also that you have students even higher than that. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. I think that's a good discussion. Thank you. Okay, major maintenance, you guys update your statuses, your work code order statuses, and we appreciate that, just keeping the database clean. You submit through Lance your uh, your um, major maintenance um, requests for work orders. He approves those that qualify, uh, doesn't for those others. Uh, so we acknowledge he does his work. We appreciate you mentioning about the 8% and have been, obviously that's clear back to like 2003 or something that was, or four or something that that was appropriated. So thanks for cleaning that up and, and we can hopefully get that off our books. Yeah, and I'd like to thank J.J. Johnson for setting me straight on that stuff because I was thinking that uh, 8%, what we were told here is that 8% had no restrictions. And I talked to Lance and Lance, said that it, everything that applies is the 10%, um, it, same thing as major maintenance. So it worked out um, that talking with our CFO, we got in, in line and we'll get rid of that, get that off the books probably prior to July. 
Yeah, that Lance, he just he just kind of keeps right within the 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 law, doesn't he? He does a great job. That's exactly right. Needs to be the calibrator. Uh, this is just il- yeah. This is illustrative uh, just of last year's uh, priorities. All it is is illustrative within it. You don't have to defend it. This is just what your expenditures were from highest to lowest last year. And it kind of keeps yeah, we'd like going to say down. On this, I was glad that you guys did this. This was really a nice feature. You know, before we had the graph, and I used to pull the graph mm-hmm. up, but I really like this because then I can. it's easier for me to go into our school board or administration and kind of show them where we need to pick up the pace or pick up the slack on some of these uh, these projects. So I, whoever did this, um, kudos to them. It was a nice addition. Well, I, yeah, we have to give JJ the credit for putting it together and Amber the credit for uh, demanding that it looks just like you see it. All right. Amber. She was very decisive. and Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, we've got the breakdown building by building as well. Same numbers, just a breakdown per building. All right. Good. Yeah, well, again, we're glad you're, another we're nice glad you're getting it. Yeah. Okay, well, maybe that's something that we'll continue then. Um, so every year we get from at least individual legislators in the process, they always ask, uh, are these school districts spending the money on their highest uh, needs, lowest scoring buildings, specifically systems? So instead of us speaking for you, we just allow you people to speak for yourselves. And if someone asks for uh, what your priorities are, are you spending money on low, uh, low scoring condition? condition uh, scores, I should say, then uh, we just hand them this and say, there you go. Let the district speak for itself. So we're not going to go through anything detailed on there unless you guys want to, but just a reminder that um, what you do is is uh, transferable to others if an authority if they want the information. Okay. Here's an explanation of why they're scored as they are. Okay, so back to this now uh, that you'd mentioned before, Dan. Uh, we are going to be putting together the scope for the next uh, condition assessment in September or so and finalizing that. And we're starting to work on uh, contracts and stuff like that uh, in preparation for that so that we have templates ready. Every four years is what state re- state law requires us to do the assessment. Uh, so we'll go through a process. The one that's really important, and you know this, is that districts show up for the training in April. It won't be on April 1st, but it'll be in April of next year. We'll provide a four-hour training in CASPER, uh, walk through the tool, um, remind everybody of what it is, how it's scored, uh, what categories, and then uh, in the past, uh, and I'm sure Sweetwater One has not done this, and we really appreciate it, uh, but in the past, there have been some school districts that have handed keys to assessors when they come on site, say, go have fun, and when you're done, bring our keys back, uh, and so that's not a good way to do it. Uh, so we right. ask districts to have the absolute best, most you know, knowledgeable person uh, for each facility. And in and, and a district like yours, that might be, you know, two of you may go hand in hand with these people, but we want you to by their side the whole time, every moment they're uh, doing assessments so that those assessments are as accurate as possible. Okay. And then the other thing, we've had uh, concerns in the past, uh, the sometimes school districts go, hey, we don't want our educational environment disrupted uh, by assessment teams. Well, with over 500 buildings that need to be done, there's just no way it's uh, within reasonable economic limits. There's no way we can do uh, over 500 buildings in two and a half months. So we will start in the spring before school starts get, uh, gets out and we'll have to go into the fall a little bit. We try not to, but uh, realistically, that's just what we have to do in order to do it. So just to give you forewarning and uh, they try not to be uh, disruptive to your educational environment, but at the same time they have to walk through and do their job. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dan, as usual, you're faithful on on uh, being a part of the component prioritization committee. Appreciate that. Uh, you've po- pointed out uh, to us maybe some opportunities to uh, improve that, um, but now this is tied to rules and regs, and so for us to do anything in, in the um, in changing the methodology for prioritizing component requests, that would have to go through um, a rules and regs um, 
formal process to be changed. Uh, so, but um, so anyway, I just wanted to remind uh, you and Brandon of that because uh, we can't just do it. We, we're going to have to go through a, a formal process to do so. It, do you understand that also, Brandon? Is that your perspective? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's pretty similar. Is that a matter of having? Is that all? Oh, is it really that political that just to ask the use? Would you call it, Brandon, the green sheets or the pink sheets? As far as what they do is uh, all of it's incorporated in the rules and regs, all the processes that we had. Yeah, the methodology, right. the matrix. Yeah. But as far as the self-reporting of, you know, uh, or can uh, I guess what I, I guess what I'm getting at is, you know, back to our discussion. What do we do when somebody lies on their report? You know, or can the the committee that is comes together? Is there a way that, you know, because we generally, I, I generally try to access their AIM projects. Um, uh, you're talking about the balance and uh, how, to, how to sniff out their cash and all that, cash on hand. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, because if, if somebody's lying and says that they don't have any money when they truly do have money, we're really doing a disservice to the small, you know, to some of the, any of the other districts that truly don't have the money. You know, and, and I, you know, somebody else is just applying because, hey, it qualifies and they're well within their right to qualify. And I'm not saying that I would deny any, you know, I think that we should deny anybody the right to qualify. I mean, if you qualify and, the, and you're playing within the rules, but if you don't state what you actually have on hand and somebody else is just really um, doesn't have the money, I don't think it's right that we give somebody else, you know, money that can fund a project and deny someone else. But, you yeah, know, what, just, comes, what comes to my mind is we'll have to read the the process and then look at where uh, if if that can be incorporated how that could be incorporated. Maybe it's just one of the tools used to in the process. So I'd have to look at it. Okay. But, well, no, let me. Is it, go ahead. Yeah. Is there any anything uh, in the rules that if the application is incomplete that it's not considered? No. No, yeah, I don't think it's not, it's not that cut and dry. But but I uh -huh. think what you're talking about, Dan, and we can look at it. I, I think you're talking about verif verification of data. That, so that, could we? So we could use an external. We could use an objective external source of of uh, data, right? Uh, to right. verify. Uh, now, one thing, Brandon, and, and you're getting us to think, Dan, and we do appreciate it. One thing is I think they're going to have to do that 680. Are they going to have to do the 680 on a quarterly basis now, Brandon? No, we'll still do that in our annual report. But okay. I would assume, but, you know, maybe to, to keep the effort or burden lower, maybe it's just done quarterly. Yeah, and, and the reason I say that is if there's some verification of balances. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the only yeah. the only verification we can do is as of June 30th of each year. That's and then the 680 comes in based on that previous uh, right. uh, fiscal year. So, uh, but if we <laughs> increase the uh, reporting of 680, then we could go straight off of the last reporting, and that would be a more accurate um, tool to use. Uh, but at the same time, by the time we do this, they're not due till September. I mean, uh, the 680, when does the 680 have to come in? August or something? Yeah. July, August? June, or July. So maybe we're still as, as late as we can get, and, and uh, maybe that's our verification tool. But um, I don't know. That's a toughie, unless, unless we're going to increase reporting. So, yeah. Troy, I think if you're going to be able to manipulate the times of the 680s, produced and reported, I think if you're able to do that, ultimately, if it would be good for that 680 to be updated in real time and actually be a progressive report. That way the I districts, uh, they, they, they are uh, getting their um, information in, you know, in real time and um, they don't have to go back and try and resurrect everything to do that report at the end of the year or quarterly as you're you're saying quarterly would be easier, but still, if you could do that, then let's go with real time and progressive all the way through. 
And, and talking to JJ, because I've been on that mantra for years, uh, the 680, and I think JJ actually said, saying he agreed, um, the 680 should be a living document. We should be able to update it that as we close out projects um, rather than going through and, and, and doing it with, you know, <laughs> doing it in June. Okay. Interesting. Brandon, you got that noted? Yeah, I think what we'll do, you know, is we're, Dan, we're still in the process of just downloading the engrossed bills and reading uh -huh. them. Um, some good stuff. I think we need to look at the bills, how it says the quarterly payments, how it all works, and how we can always raise the bar and improve on the process. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks for those suggestions. Really appreciate it. And we do. We want an equitable process that honors everybody and and uh, doesn't um, doesn't unfairly through either ignorance or uh, willful willful uh, neglect or uh, um, action um, allow someone to unfairly get um, prioritized above another district. Uh, uh, that perhaps is uh, dealing a little more with integrity or carefulness with the numbers that they put into those requests. Okay, so um, as you guys know, uh, well, I keep saying that because you guys have been around a while, sorry. Uh, the the We started integrating through Brandon's recommendation last year uh, just to talk about the legislative bills that are going through. Uh, we know that on the education side, the, you guys have a mechanism, um, I think through WASA or WASBO or something, I know it's on that website at least, that uh, to track educational bills and, and kind of all be informed. Um, so we've improved on our side to provide you updates on bills that may not necessarily, they may be included on the education side that you guys are tracking, but may not, that can have an impact on you with regard to facilities management, and what you do. Uh, so with that, then we're gonna have Brandon kind of walk through, uh, this was a, as of last Friday, so it's not up to date. Uh, a lot happens uh, even hourly at the legislature. So uh, he'll, he'll go through and if he knows any other changes, but this is just historic from last Friday. Go ahead, Brandon. Yeah, I'll deviate a little bit from here because I got my computer screen as, as Troy mentioned. I've been updating it as it goes, but uh, red is dead, green is alive. So I won't go to the dead ones because they are really not applicable because they're dead. Uh, first one is House Bill 52. That's on the public works uh, and contracts. So you'll want to probably get with Plan 1 and start incorporating some of this into your uh, documents. It's on the procurement of ff &E. Uh, and it, the specification shall be written by Wyoming supplier only. The next one is House Bill 65, Procurement Amendment. Dan, you know, you're fully aware of this one. This is the one that was born out of our uh, construction coalition team. Uh, the goal is to increase the values to present dollars, uh, present value of today's dollars. And it's at $50,000, so hopefully this helps um, get some more work out, um, and also keep some of the locals employed because it the bonding went up to fifty thousand versus seventy five hundred bucks. Right, but then they also keep in that first paragraph that we have to follow procurement on. And now, is that procurement on fifty thousand or twenty five thousand dollars worth of services? It went up to fifty. So there's a tiered system, and there's zero to twenty five. You call your guy around the corner. 25 to 50, or yeah, zero to 25, you just get somebody and go, blow and go. 25 to 50, you call around, get a couple quotes, you know, to see what the price is. And then 50 and above, you, above, you go through a procurement process. Right, okay. So House Bill 78, this is the one that you were just talking about, takes your payments and goes to quarterly payments. Mm -hmm. House Bill 79, 
is uh, is funding transfers between all the coffee cans and accounts on school uh, funds. Uh, the next one I'm going to hit is House Bill 82. That doesn't apply to you guys. That's on the state CM side, but it passed. Um, House Bill 94 died, and that was one that was also in our construction coalition team, sort of. Um, but it talked about, uh, oh, sorry, that's the indemnification. So that one died. But that's a different one. So that was about re redoing the indemnification clause. So Dan, that would have affected our contracts is where we would have to incorporate that. Right. The one I wanted to talk to you about, let's see, the next one is House Bill 52, 152. Uh, that's utilities. So this would probably need to be in your design, uh, in your in your bid documents. And it's about the uh, underground utilities, since you're going to be doing civil work. The big change there is it increased from $500 to $5,000. Senate file 49 passed last night. So if you've got any private schools going up, that would affect you. Uh, that's just making sure private schools and public schools are have comparable uh, amenities. Public records will probably affect you guys a little bit on the school side. That's Senate File 57. Um, Senate File 74, I think, passed too. That is another amendment, Dan, to that same statute, professional services. Yeah, yeah I know. Now, they, <laughs> they excluded schools. They actually reverted back to the first paragraph as it stands today. So how how's that gonna how's that gonna work with uh, uh, fit um, sixty five? Well, you know yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I don't know, Dan. So what's happening is they'll have multiple statutes or multiple bills that are tinkering with the same statute. So what I want to know, and this will be a great example, is once it passes, how is that reconciled, and what's it come out at? You know, how do you blend right. those? So. <clears throat> I'll let you know on here in a couple of days. Because <laughs> yeah, like, their their bill is actually written the way I you know the way that we well the way I wanted it as right. far as excluding us and it had all the other amenities so yeah that's that's gonna be interesting I can't wait to see what happens there. Yeah, how how it blends when they're in, in one statute, two bills in one statute. So yeah. Let's see, the last one down there is the House Bill 1, which had your project in it. So scroll up a little bit. We can look at the projects that are in there. Uh, the most important one is probably the one at the top. <laughs> uh, for us. Yeah, exactly. Uh, John C. Schiffer, that's a Sheridan 2 one. Uh, you got a modular reappropriations of some existing funds on a whole modular project to, to do another modular for a ranch school. Uh, we have charter school lease in Laramie. We got unanticipated money uh, for your school and John C. Schiffer. Uh, uh, we have some security projects that we talked about earlier. The governor vetoed that, so that's a good thing. You'll be a beneficiary of that. And also the major maintenance payment went up uh, when we ran the RS means calculation, um, or we ran the calculation, the RS means number was higher this year. So that went up a little bit, and then we have another. So that, million, that million dollars will be tacked on to the overall budgeted amount. Is that what that means? Yeah, yeah, and then that'll be dipped up in, in uh, to the appropriate percentages and all that. Just when we ran the calculation, we we're like nine hundred and seventy-three thousand short, based upon the the RS means number going up. Every year it goes up a little bit, so. Yeah. We're always just a little short. So we go ahead and ask for it if we're short. So Dan, we don't think you're going to get more than nine hundred thousand out of that million. Is that okay? Yeah, that's that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> as long as I get my my funding for a satellite and demo money for Lincoln, I'll be a happy camper. <laughs> Boy, that put a house quiet. <laughs> 
<laughs> on the demo or the satellite? <laughs> I'm probably at this point more on the demo. <laughs> so in the budget request, that's what you've got there is demo, right? Correct. So let me tell you two things. One, we've already talked about the process that Troy went over and really extensive about how do you prioritize the needs and all that. So what I'm realizing going through facility plans is that process that's in our rules and regulations, it doesn't address other stuff. And one of them is demo. Where does demo pro demoing a facility come into play in the methodology? or in the rules and regs. It doesn't really account for it. So that's one of the hurdles we'll have to go through. The other thing I would like to point out is uh, Troy uh, jumped to House Bill 1 and jumped to the bottom of it. So I don't know what your intent was after you demo the building. Were you going to keep the land, sell the land? No, we'll keep the land because we can use another practice field for the high school, you know, and, and especially if, should the district end up, um, or the state, I guess, is what we're waiting for. Should the state sanction girls softball, we're going to need a practice field for girls softball. And so looking ahead, um, that field, you know, that whole entire complex here would just be a practice facility. Okay. Because if you were going to sell it, they added some language at the bottom of House Bill 1. And in summary, the way I read it, if you sell it, I would meet you at the title company and I would take the proceeds from the sale and then I would deposit it into the state construction or what is it called? State. I'd send it to the state treasurer or there's a specific account that it will go to. Right. Um, so this is a new new paradigm. Um, when districts are liquidating assets, uh, where's the account? Right there, state capital construction account. So anybody that starts selling buildings or land, you'll want to read this because the way I read it, it like I said, I'd just meet you there and I'd take the check and then we'd go get lunch and I'd head back and deposit it into that account. Are you buying lunch? Uh, no, sir. Yeah, no, we ain't selling. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to give you a heads up on this. So if you do sell, yeah. this statute will probably um, weigh into that decision. This is before you, know, you this is, money, right? You're right. Yeah. Yeah, this whole thing is interesting because, you know, here in Rock Springs, as we found out with Lowell, one of the reasons we kept Lowell was the reversion clauses. And we have an awful lot of schools that actually have the reversion clause with, uh, you know, it's UP and, and some other company, you know, it's a portion of UP in the way that they name it. So it's it's actually better for, it's easier legally for us just to keep the damn buildings and keep them on the site and just yeah. do something with them than it is to demo it. Because if we demo it, then we're in violation of the reversion clause. And it, it's, it's the most complex thing I've ever seen. Even our attorney, you know, going through with him at Lowell, it was just after days of looking over how we can manage things. It was just, you know what, we'd be easier. It'd be easier for everybody just to do the partial demo and a renovation and keep the building. Okay. One second, Dan, just about talking about Lowell. Rajat was trying to rename that for you. And yeah. when we look back on that. I, I just want to throw this in here is when we look at the property profiles, we have low as a learning, what was it? What was the title? We've had the name uh, learn, uh, Special Educational Building, but we also have it as a uh, disposed building. Is that not correct? Is that still in your inventory? As a what? Uh, it's disposed, meaning it's not in your inventory anymore. No, it's Lowell. Lowell, we did a partial demolition. We demoed, I think it was like the 1923 building. And we renovated the lower floor of the the two or two newer additions. So no, it's it has Lowell has not been disposed of. A portion of it was, and I forget what the it might be like nineteen thousand square feet. Something I I don't have the numbers in front of me, but yeah, so you know, it's, it, it was nineteen thousand eight hundred sixty-seven square feet, but now it's ten thousand two hundred thirty-two. 
That's it. Okay, and now it's called, in, in the AIM system, it's not called um, Old Lowell Elementary School, it's called Lowell Special Education Building. So is, do, I, do you still want to use the, the no. traditional education? We want to, no, we want to change to what we just discussed. Lowell okay. Trans, yeah, Lowell Transitional School. Cool. Okay, gotcha. And Thank then you, Roger. Roy, in the in the in our facility plan, it's it was still listed as nineteen thousand square feet with the FCI score. I think we need to change that as well. That was the old score. That was the plan. old report from two thousand sixteen. That's okay, always gotcha. an unfortunate. No, no, no. Not, I'm not talking about the FCI. I'm talking about the square foot. It's still listed as nineteen thousand on the on our facility plan. Yeah, you know, I'm going to have to check and see. Um, report from two thousand six. Okay, yeah. gotcha. That's not ever going to okay. happen. Change. Cool. All right. Just clarifying that though. Cool. And I will get that changed right now. Thank you. So Lowell Transitional School will be the new name. Uh, educational nine through twelve. Active. Yep. yep. And that's already it's just the name that needs to be changed. All that's already there. Oh good. All right, that's why we do this, catch this stuff. Um, so back to your point, Brandon, and obviously uh, we know that you guys, I mean, it sounds to me like you want to request and we're gonna put in that you're requesting demolition funds for Lincoln ES, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So my only recommendation would be to go ahead and have you done all the public notice and all that stuff? Dan? Was, say that again, Brandon. Have you done the public notice board hearing? No, no in fact, uh, I had a contractor out there and we're, I just contacted him now, which is why I wasn't paying attention to you to find out if he had our numbers because what we're going to do first is get a um, an estimate from a contractor, just a, a rough idea so that I can get with Lance and by the time we get the estimate and run it by, I mean, I'm not so sure that I want to go stir up the community if if this is something that can't even happen. I mean, if it's not in the budget, you know, I'd rather take care of my logistical part first, you know, asbestos, you know, get a, a rough estimate from our local asbestos abatement crew and, and our local contractor, get my numbers put together, then a present, you know, get with Lance, do a budget sheet. And then if it's something that you guys say, hey, you know what, this is doable, then I'll do my advertisement. But, when it, man, it, it just sucks on my end to do advertisement get everybody stirred up and then if we don't get the funding it's like i'm, I'm answering for the next two years oh so what are you guys going to do at low and what happened with, you know or with lincoln so yeah i hear you my my thought was to make sure i mean i don't know how this is going to shake out to be honest with you right. but at least you were ready to go and we got the green light it's ready to go that's yeah those, all the but, all, you know, in, on the demolitions I've done in the past, you know, it, it seems like, and, and Lance, step in if I'm if I'm not recalling right. But it seems like if I've got my numbers and you know we have a budget, um, doing the advertisement and, and that goes pretty fast. I mean, you're talking a minimum of, of 30 days, and usually you guys know whether this is going to fly or not once I give you the numbers. So, you know, if I had the numbers by you know mid March you guys would know, hey, is it possible or not? If you say, Dan, there's no way in heck you're going to get this hat, you know, to happen this year. You know, if you say, yeah, you know, this this looks good, then we can go ahead and advertise. Like I said, in 30 days, we've had our public meetings and we're, you know, mid-April, which really isn't bad timing. Okay. So just want to point out 2115-116A, uh, it says the plan shall not include the abandonment or demolition of any facility or uh, or building unless there has first been a public hearing on the issue. So, I, and, and if I just heard you right, Dan, and, and we're going to have to reverse the process. Uh, so, I mean, we you've well, got to go through that public. Two different things. Isn't this kind of two different things? I'm just kind of saying, hey, you know, what's the possibility of getting demo money? Yeah. I mean, I mean, to me, it's two different things. If, if I, 
if I was going to say, hey, we're definitely, you know, we're going to demo, this is our plan, and I knew that we had our funding, I mean, I I look at it as, as you know, I see what you're you're pointing out, and I understand that. But in my mind, I wouldn't put it on, you know, that we're going to be demoing Lowell unless I did all my, you know, pre financing, you know, investigate or Lincoln, I keep saying little Lincoln, um, you know, first, and then I would put it in because I would know, hey, we're ready to go on this. And then I just like we've done with Lowell, you know, we did, you know, we included that in our facility plan, we went out to public. But just say, for instance, if I didn't put anything on this plan, and tomorrow, the day after this, you know, the day after our interview, I decided, hey, you know what, Lance, I'd, I'd like to demo Lowell, you know, is there any way that I can you know, see if we have the money, I think the process for me would be the same. I still have to come up with a, a rough estimate. Lance would review it and say, well, let's put together a budget sheet and see if it's possible. You guys would say yes or no, it is possible or it isn't. Then I would do, then I, at that point, I start my actual, what the state statute requires. And then I present my budget numbers officially and, and we move forward from there. Or, I mean, am I looking at this the wrong way? Dan, I, I I agree. I think we sort of parallel it. Like you do your due diligence, everything except for the public, or is it a, except for that statute, public hearing. Right. And then we communicate, and I can say, hey, Dan, Troy, and I, I mean, we're going to be working on this new process. We say, hey, this process, we got to we gotta figure it out. Go ahead and start the public hearing. Or we could say, hey, this process is not working out. Don't start the public process. Right. And in the meantime, you got all your numbers, you know what it costs, how, how it work. So I think we need to just communicate as we get closer to submitting things in the budget. Right. And, and Dan, I've already got a draft of that budget done uh, just on our numbers. So I'm, I'm waiting. As soon as you get your numbers back, we'll plug them in, and I, I have that ready. Okay, very good. Good. I mean, if we had to take off, what's that? I was wondering what the building scores for as condition. Yeah, that's what Always. I'm looking at. We we don't even have it <laughs> down here for some reason, and I'm not sure why not. Um, well, oh, there it is, Lincoln. One time, yeah, it was. It's okay. Yeah, it's pretty. So the it's, the challenge to this, Brandon, is that Lincoln Elementary School is a point three four. Right. Uh, I mean, it's it's down there. So in order, so here, here's just the reality of our, our situation. Uh, um, now, next time it gets assessed, if that number pops up to a higher number, that's a whole different right. story. But right okay. now, from an equitability point of view, I mean, it's yeah, probably, it's what, 20th down on the, the FCI list. And so we wouldn't, from an equitability point of view, we wouldn't be able to promote that above these other things above it. Um, because because we have to go off the list as a list. Does that make sense? Yeah, but let, let's talk equitability. I only see one school, one building up there that you have marked vacant. So if if the state has an opportunity to take down a building without replacing that building, is that not equitable? Well, we would be jumping someone else's need ahead of yours. Well, but if right. somebody we else is wanting it to be demoed and then they require a replacement of, you know, if, if you're going to approach from an equitability standpoint, yeah, I, I understand, you know, what you're saying, but I, you know, if this is not a replacement of, we're just taking it down to a eliminate square footage and B just, you know, get rid of the building. Yeah, that's that's kind of the quandrum we're in right now. Um, so, uh, and in this next commission meeting in Casper, uh -huh. uh, we're going to have Fremont 25 here in Riverton be presenting this. Uh, they're looking at the Tonkin Activity Center, and they're right. wanting to potentially demo demo it. Right. Um, so, uh, but that Tonkin, uh, and actually that one is right here uh, at point four four, so it's higher up. Uh, on this right. list um but uh, so so it's kind of weird because state systems are state systems just like perhaps school district systems are um you know they're they're great at in, in generally to address 
address issues or needs in, in a categorical fashion. Uh, with sideboards on it uh, that help 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 your district or the state um, prioritize that and and value that uh, within certain metrics of of uh, um, of value, I guess. Now the problem here is that that we've been in such a, a growth uh, capitalization improvement, you know, and so as, as we've as we've gone to asset preservation. Um, our state statutes and rules and regs and stuff are still in this capitalization world. Uh, and right. they don't necessarily address asset preservation and getting rid of square footage. For instance, I'm sure you would be more than happy not to spend a dime on that building insurance. Um, you know, are you still heating it or is it unheated yeah, now? Yeah, we still have to heat it. We still have yeah. to maintain the roof. Yep. I mean, it's yeah. a money pit. Yeah, all those things. And so we're going to be kind of talking about that during the TAC presentation. And I think this would be, uh, I hope you can attend that Casper meeting, Dan, but I think this would be something that would be great to to bring up in conjunction to that during maybe public comment, uh, okay. where uh, now there is a state statute, and I can't remember, Brandon, maybe you can remember, there is a state statute that talks about reducing, um, oh, God, I can't remember the exact wording, but it's basically uh, reducing square footage or looking for opportunities to reduce square footage within school districts. And I think that that would probably be valuable to find. And I can't remember, I'm not getting the right wording. Um, so we're, we're with you. I mean, we, we agree that uh, it's going to save you and, and the state a lot of money if you guys uh, decide to dispose that building. Uh, and then you can concentrate on the buildings that have students in it and are supporting those students. Right. So it's kind of a no yeah. man's land that we're in right now. And, and we're going to have no, to I, get something to address it. And I'd love to address the commission on this one because two years ago I spent, had to spend – eighty-seven thousand dollars on a boiler system because the old steam boiler is is gone i mean it's it's broken so i have 50 percent of the building was heated by steam and what we have to do is overheat the building in order to keep that other wing you know warm because i don't want to spend a steam boiler costs a little bit more i don't want to spend another ninety thousand dollars on a board on you know, on a boiler that I'm never going to use anyplace else. The boilers that I put in the Lincoln, the reason why I decided, you know, to go ahead and put those eighty-seven thousand dollars, or might even been a hundred something thousand dollars, in with boilers, is because should we demo the building, I can take those boilers and use them in one of my other schools. Right now, I have fifty percent at school, and those classrooms are kindergarten classrooms, so they, you know, we've had to blow out lines, but you're still going to get water in the lines, so I can never use it. It's going to be disastrous this spring because that, that steam boiler is gone. And if I bought a steam boiler to put in there just to maintain my building, I'm never going to use a steam boiler anyplace else in this district. So it's, you know, it's just becoming a, a, a building that is served its usefulness. Um, we don't want anything else other than the lot there. Um, so yeah, I'd be more than happy to bring this up. Yeah, I think this would be just a, uh, and it's it's the world we're in, and we don't we don't want these old buildings sitting around, uh, sucking up resources, when there's no intention whatsoever to um, to er ever use them back for as an educational s or for s support facility. Right. Okay. I'm trying to find that real quick, guys, but I don't know if I. And am I glad I didn't go out to advertise for for the demo on this thing, <laughs> or notif public notification. Yeah, don't title oh, this. Golly. <laughs> yeah, don't. Hey, don't ever jump in, in front of us, buddy. Uh, uh, before the process, twenty-one fifteen one sixteen. That's a. Let me write that down real quick, guys. So that's what we talked about the A in there before. Yeah, twenty-one fifteen one sixteen, and then I'm going to go down. That's a Roman numeral one, two, three, four, five, six. I missed, oh, there's a B, C. Okay, here we go. D. So the reference is D. This is probably not what you guys want to do, but yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, whoops. I don't know. I just goofed. Mark, can you call Jasmine and see what he needs? Yes. Yeah. 
anyway, we'll we'll look into that and hopefully we can get something where we can there we go. That was it right there. I just wanted okay. to see what that title was on this on the statute real quick. Uh, school districts facility plans develop, review, and approve plan criteria, administrative review, collaborative committee process. So these this is under school facility plans. And we're supposed to look at at least once every two years, the commission shall review and uh, approve each plan developed by the department to ensure each plan reduces building and facility needs in the most efficient and cost-effective manner in order to deliver quality educational services. So even though this is a non-educational building right now, it, it does impact quality educational services because it's thinning out resources that can go toward buildings that have students in them, is my interpretation. Anybody right. interpret that differently? I would agree. Let me ask you something, Brandon. Since this building is closed, what do we get financially for this building? Well, I guess we don't do it that way anymore, but am I getting funded for the square footage of this building with zero ADM? No. Polluting your, your balance. Right. That's, Which yeah. Okay. From the educational program, because you, you're... You're just throwing money in the garbage can, really, right now. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, to re-roof that thing would be a waste of, of a lot of resources. Oh, huge, yeah. If you're not using it and there's not butts in the seats, it's really bad deal. Not only no, on your grants, but your block grants getting diluted every day, too, if you're paying heat bills and whatnot. Right, yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll finish that. Uh, that. I'll finish... I'll finish my uh, comment there maybe after this meeting before I send it on. Uh, okay. Or I can do it right now. Here, I can do it. Just do it while we're out here. Okay. At least we've kind of wrapped up. That, that was a really good discussion. I look forward to having this with the commission. And it's just uh, sometimes, sometimes the systems that you have in place or the state statute doesn't necessarily address all the unique circumstances that arise that uh, that could save the state a lot of money and the district a lot of money but it doesn't fit within the little little guidelines of what we need to do right yeah okay anyway right. we've never uh, we'll we'll get on so uh J raj if you don't mind in our in our um, tasks list um, yeah. Just reference 2115116A and D I. Uh, actually, it should be just one I, a set of eyes. Just the fact that we're, uh, we're we need to probably review state statutes with regard to um, reducing square footage. I think there may be one more in there, and we'll just kind of get ready and hopefully we can give a little bit of a presentation uh, in conjunction with the Fremont 25 presentation that talks about the the uh the challenges with regard to reducing square footage and yet at the same time we have this this prioritization process that really is a capitalization versus an asset preservation type of of uh, philosophy in state statute and how we're going to potentially deal with that okay that was a lot raj just captured as best you can we'll get there that's why we made notes raj you have their demo project on the list what no Add that one. Okay, uh, and then you made a statement. Uh, are we o okay to move on, Brandon? You have anything else? No. Go ahead. Okay. Good. Uh, so this last statement here, uh, before we close out, I know you have this one and any others, but Dan, you want to lead us through this, or have we kind of um, we, we've already yeah, talked we actually, about the quarterly payments. Yeah, we already talked about the quarterly payments, and we also talked about the uh, the procurement process. You know, it was presented as an option. You know, that offered more flexibility. When the reality is, we have total flexibility right now because we're not even included in the uh, the mix as to who has to and when they have to go out for procurement for professional services. The way our board policy reads is that you know the board will accept who I recommend, and based on uh, current state statute, um, unless I'm receiving capital funds, and that's where we we've always drawn the distinction. But major maintenance money we perceive as being our money because the state gives it to us to use, 
And so whenever it came to using a project, uh, doing a project under major maintenance or even district, uh, you know, funded projects, um, I could just go and select whomever I thought was competent enough and, you know, would do the job. And so I, I had a lot of concerns with them actually now telling us. And at the time when I reviewed the, you know, when I was looking at the state statute, it was $25,000. And if you, if I do a roofing job or a major parking lot repair, my, my professional services are going to be more than $25,000. And I, I just didn't feel that this was in the best interest of at least my school district. And I've talked to, as you guys know, a lot of the other school districts, in fact, at the last commission meeting, we had a real good turnout with uh, other facility folks. And then we actually had, uh, they came over to my motel the next morning and we uh, met again, you know, and they all have the same concerns, you know, that, you know, right now we have the ability to just pick who we want. So most of us that have one or two professional services in our own backyard, that's kind of who we use and to follow a process to only, you know, go with whom, whom we feel. I mean, I, I just don't think it's right. I, I really don't. I mean, we have professionals here that have families and they support our district. And to open it up or go to, you know, and I'm talking about the way the bill was written, um, you know, to it, 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 from what I understand, and Brandon, correct me, but when I read through that, that bill, it actually made me responsible for checking the updated professional service list that you know is registered with the state and I don't feel like I should have to do that because it said that you know the owner or owner's rep has to look at review the list and notify the people on the list and it's just like you know man that that's extra you know extra steps that I now have to do that I didn't have to do before so you yeah. know that was that was some heartburn understand and the process there is uh, not the state's list but uh, you would have a, a a fleet of architects and engineers on on as needed contracts and you would then go out to those guys that's that's the review the process or review the list of those on file so right, right. now we have i like laramie one has a ton of them on as needed contracts we have some on as needed contracts um I don't know about all districts. I just know Laramie One does for sure, but you can do implement the same process. Right, and I get that, but you know, it really is it necessary to legislate it? Because Cheyenne has multiple architects. You know, we'll pick on architects. Casper has multiple architects. You know, so for me to have on contract multiple architects means I'm going to have one guy from Rock Springs <laughs> and everybody else is going to be from two hours or more away that I'm more than likely not going to use. Right. And so really, I mean, everybody is now in the same category just because really three, three cities have those amenities available to them. And I, I just, it just doesn't make sense. One could say your list will be short. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> I mean, you might just have two on the list. Yeah, and that, you know, and I'm tired, you know, so after talking with my group, they all asked me, you know, I says, look, I'm already trying to figure, you know, I'm already working on a way to get out and, you know, get around it. Um, and ha having a contract uh, with an architect or an engineering firm um, on hand in, in advance is, I guess, the best way to do it for, you know, satisfy the statute. Yeah. Okay. District, anything else before we close the meeting? No, we're good. Okay. Uh, Mark and Kelly, thank you so much for attending this meeting. And, and uh, I'll be kind of careful how I say this, but sometimes uh, we don't get um, holistic district participation in these. So we really appreciate uh, your time and your roles within that district and, and being involved in, in facilities because it makes a huge difference uh, for the students in your and staff in your, in your in your community. So thank you so much for doing that. Thank you guys. Thank you. Okay, staff, anything else before we close? Nothing for me, Troy, thanks. I just okay. want to uh, thank you district for your work. Oh, thanks, Amber, thanks, for Amber. working with us. No problem. 
Hey, thanks everybody then. We're gonna go ahead and close out the meeting and look forward to seeing you in person next time we, we uh, cross paths. Take care. Thank you. Casper. All right. All right. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.